Psalms 11, please. Beginning in verse 1, it says, In the Lord put I my trust. So how say you to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For lo, the wicked hath bent their bow. They make ready their arrow upon the string, that they may privately shoot at the upright in heart. If the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven, and his eyes behold. His eyelids try the children of men. The Lord trieth the righteous, but the wicked and him that loveth violence his soul hateth. Upon the wicked he shall rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. This shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord, I'm sorry, for righteous, for the righteous Lord loveth righteousness, and his countenance doth behold the upright. Amen. You ever see the countenance of someone that is in disfavor with you? You ever get the look from mom or dad when you were growing up that you knew you were in trouble? But did you also see the glee in their eye when they smiled at you because they were very pleased with you? It's kind of what the psalmist is saying. He's saying that the countenance of the Lord favors the upright. You and I in Jesus Christ... If your faith is in the Son of God for your salvation, and that alone, you have the smile of God the Father on your spirit and upon your life. Amen. I want God's smile on me. I want His countenance to be favorable to me. Amen. I don't want His disfavor this morning. Praise the Lord. And I'm going to read a verse out of Proverbs 30. There is a generation that curses their father and doth not bless their mother. There is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet is not washed from their filthiness. There is a generation, oh, how lofty are their eyes and their eyelids are lifted up. This morning's message, if we could just put a title to it, I'm going to call it Raising Up the Former Desolations. Raising Up the Former Desolations desolations. Friend, we need a move of God. I need a move of God. You need a move of God in your life. And God is ever willing. But will we come to Him and will we allow Him to do the great work that only He can do? That's up to you. The Word of God still tells us if you will draw near to God, you make the first move towards Him, God will draw near to you. Before we pray, I've always said this, I've been saying this a lot lately, but right now as we sit here in this house, you are as close to God as you want to be. You say, well, I want to be closer to God. Proof's in the pudding, friend. You're as close to God as you want to be. If you want to be closer, draw near to Him. He will draw near to you. Raising up the former desolation, let's go to Him in prayer. Father, Again, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for those that have gathered in your name this morning. We thank you for the live stream audience, Lord, that listens faithfully just about every week. We ask you this morning, Lord, to fill our sanctuary with your presence, your spirit, your touch. Lord, move on the preacher that he has and can speak the oracles of God. And move in the hearts of those that hear this word. That it would do a deep work in our spirit, man, a deep work in our heart. And encourage us and challenge us to rise up in Jesus Christ and be a genuine Christian. Father, help us and strengthen us today. In the name of the Lord Jesus, everybody said amen and amen. Praise the Lord. There was a recent survey taken of churchgoers with a supposed attendance of at least three services per month. And this survey was taken in the circle of what is known as evangelical churches, churches that should know the true gospel message. This is what they found. They found of those surveyed that over 40% of them say they are not born again. Imagine that. Imagine that. 40% of those surveyed that go at least three times a month to evangelical churches, and this was a nationwide survey, say they are not born again. 35% of them declare that the Bible has errors, or they're not sure if it has errors. 
As they went on with this survey, they found that close to 90% of them attend or did attend public schools. As the survey continued, they said that over 45% of those surveyed said that the Sunday school they were in did not teach them to defend their faith. That's probably why they lost it when they grew up and got into real life. And then 45% of them say that homosexual behavior is not a sin or they're not sure or they don't know if it's a sin. 40% of those surveyed believe that gay couples should be allowed to marry and have legal rights. And 20% say that there are books other than the Bible that are inspired by God. As the survey was winding down, 65% of them believe that if you are a good person, you will somehow make it to heaven. 65% believe that if they just try to live right and live good, they'll get to heaven somehow. Now, this is the real shocker of this survey. This nationwide research and this survey was conducted with people in their 20s. People in their 20s. This is what they believe. And this is what they're not sure of. Let's think about this for a moment. 40% of them say they're not born again. Imagine that this morning. 40% of those surveyed in their 20s say that they don't know about being born again. They're not sure if they are born again. They don't feel they need to be born again. But let me just go on to declare something. Jesus said it this way to a very religious man. He said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. To be born again scripturally is what we call regeneration. It's called the new heart and the new spirit that one receives upon believing upon Jesus Christ and Him crucified for their sin. Amen? And this has been the big, how can I say, dividing line between the true church and what you know as the denominational world. Many people grow up in a system, in a religious system. Many are told from a young child on that by the sacraments you're saved. Others say it's church membership. Others say there's other things. You know, oh, just believe and you'll be all right. Or just be part of our little group and you're okay. But that does not bring a person to what is known as regeneration. My friend, have we been regenerated this morning? Have you received a new heart and a new spirit? Because if you have, you're going to be the first one to know it. And everybody around you will know something has changed in your life. Amen? Praise the Lord. Jesus came to save. Jesus came to heal. Jesus came to deliver. Jesus came to make the sinner free. Jesus came to take my sin away. But he also came to take away that old stony, wicked heart of mine and give me a brand new heart and a brand new life. It's called the abundant life in Jesus Christ. I thank God this morning that I am born of God, born again, saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And hallelujah, I've been serving him for 32 years, saved off a bar stool. Bender's Tavern in Fond du Lac in the fall of 1984. I received a new heart that night because somebody had told me about having to receive Jesus Christ. I put it off. I was a good Lutheran boy. I didn't need all that. You know, I was, they, I was baptized into the system. They told me I was okay. They said I was made a child of God by my infant baptism, which the Bible does not teach. You can't find it in the Bible. And there's only one Bible that tells us uh, what the doctrine of God is. Amen. Amen. There's not 40, 50, 60 Bibles. I know there's a lot of versions of Bibles, but there's only one book called the Word of God. And that is the only authority by which man can produce doctrine. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So think about it this morning. Are you born again? Are you born again? Amen. I don't care if we're 90 years old or for 15. Are you born again? What are you trusting in for your salvation? Amen. Think about that. So how many of them, 45% say that they're not born again, or 40%? 40% say they're not born again. Jesus said, you have to be born again. You want to argue with him? Amen. I, I won't fight the Word of God. This has been said years ago. If you argue with the Word of God, my friend, you're wrong. You're wrong. Amen. You know, we're in a generation that doesn't want to be told what's right or what's wrong. And when you tell them wrong, the rebellion in that heart says they challenge it. 
they challenge it. Amen. 40% said you don't have to be born again. And these people are churchgoers, at least they claim to be. 35% of them declared the Bible has errors or they're not sure if it has errors. I got a word, a scripture for those that are maybe in doubt about that very thing. The Word of God tells us in 2 Timothy chapter 3 that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it is profitable for doctrine, for correction, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness. Amen? Thank God. This is the unshakable Word of God. Amen? Inspired, hallelujah, written and penned by men over the span of 1,700 years, 40 plus authors, most of which never knew each other. Amen? And, they, and when you put all these books together, it reads as one book. This is the infallible, the engrafted Word of God that is able to save your soul. Amen? Hallelujah. In fact, the book of Revelation tells us if we add to this book or take away from it, the curses of Revelation will be added to that person that says that we need to add to the Bible or take away from Scripture. I never understood about that in the denominational world. I never understood that in churches called evangelical that claim to be Christian churches. I've never understood why it is that they have doctrines in their church systems that are not endorsed by the Scriptures. Amen? And that sows a subtle confusion into the body of Christ. Amen. Number one, we must be born again. Number two, we have a foundational word. Amen. And as we read in our text this morning, if the foundations be destroyed, what shall the righteous do? If you destroy the foundation of the scripture, what do you, then your opinion is as good as my opinion. But I'm here to say God's word doesn't give an opinion. It gives his word. It's a yes, it's a no. It's a yes, it's a no. It's a yes or it's a no. Amen. It's very clear. Well, that's your interpretation. No, no, no. You know, everybody that says that has a rebellion in that heart. They don't even want to find out if it's the truth. They just know you're trying to proclaim a doctrine that they don't like. I never understood this church circles that negate the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in other tongues. It is one of the clearest doctrines set forth in the new covenant. You can't hide it. It is a willful ignorance at that point. Amen? And that is wrong. It will hurt that person. It will hurt that church. Amen? They say, oh, we love Jesus, we love his word. No, you don't love his word when you cut out a third of the new covenant by saying that's all passed away. We had a prayer uh, line here this morning for those that need a miracle. I still believe God is a miracle-working God. I still believe we could call on the living God. I still believe in Jesus Christ can still heal, set the captive free, can heal a sick body, and can provide your every single need. Hallelujah. He can put your heart together, your life together, together he could save your children he could save your spouse amen he's a living God very active in his people and in the body of Christ amen think about that wow hallelujah you know one thing you find in a church a true church if that man is called of God and if he's preaching first of all he's preaching without favor and without compromise amen that heart is going to be dealt with you know, in the early founding of this country, when the preacher would preach, they were going to establish a nation where there would be freedom of worship of God according to the dictates of their heart and one that would not hold back the word of God. In those early colonies, when they had a preacher come over and he would come and preach from overseas and they would get him to come and help establish the colonies in their early days. If that preacher couldn't preach for three hours, they said he wasn't worth his pinch of salt. Think about that. And when that preacher preached, he didn't, he didn't coddle them. He didn't tell them nice little niceties. He preached to them the scripture, the word of God, what it's going to take to build a life, to build a prosperous nation, to build a prosperous home, to build a blessed home, a blessed life. Those preachers would preach, amen. And those that didn't listen, it was to their peril. Amen. And they would gather on that Sunday, and he'd preach for three hours. They'd break for lunch on the grounds, and then they'd get ready for the three-hour afternoon lecture. That don't happen on Sundays no more, does it? Amen. It interferes with the Packer game. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 35% declare that the Bible has errors, and they don't know if it has errors. No, they're hoping it has errors because it will deal with their heart. It will deal with their lifestyle. 
You know, when I read this Bible, when it tells me the conduct of my life, even to the point of the intents of my heart and my inner motives, even to the point of my inner thought life, I come under conviction. I realize that God, His eyes are over the righteous. His ears are open to their cries. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Wow. Think about that. Think about that. Wow. No, this Bible is God's book. It is His Word. It is the owner manual, owner's manual to the human life. All men, all life came from God. Amen. We didn't evolve. There was no Big Bang. The only Big Bang that's coming is when Jesus Christ exits heaven to get His church. Amen. And He comes again to set up His earthly kingdom on this earth. Amen. Hallelujah, when the armies of heaven come and put down all rebellion and all authorities that are opposed to God. Ninety percent of them said, supposedly attended the public school. You know, it wouldn't be so bad. Public schools would be good schools if they would just be neutral. If they would just teach grammar, they would just teach math. If they would teach accurate history, not rewritten history. There would be nothing wrong with the public school system if they could teach unbiased topics of educational needs. There would be nothing wrong with that. The problem is, since we kicked God out of the schools way back in the early 60s when they said push prayer out of schools, we don't want God in it. You know, in the 50s, the big trouble in public schools was talking out of turn and people, kids sticking their gum under the desk. Today, the fear is plunder, rape, mayhem, gun shooting or school shootings, outright rebellion. Something has changed. And in our public school system, it has not become an educational center as it should be. It has become a place where your children become indoctrinated. Indoctrination. They're not getting an education in the arithmetic, the math, the English. The, they're getting an education. They're being indoctrinated to be dependent on the powers that be, the governmental systems that will be in place in the next 20 years, should the Lord tarry. What they're learning in our public schools, if you would look at pre-World War II in Nazi Germany, you would realize that our children are being taught to honor not just the president, but a man that would almost be a dictator-type individual, that they would hold up this man and support his policies because he will bring us to true prosperity. That happened in Nazi Germany, and six million Jews later gassed in Auschwitz's ovens in many Concentration camps across the German landscape. 50 million people died as a result of World War II because the educational systems taught the German people to listen to that one voice, the wrong one. Hallelujah. That's why, folks, if you can, homeschool, if you can't afford it, and God, if God puts it on your heart, he'll help you to provide. Get your kids into Christian education. I thank God that God made a way for Liz and I to put our boys through Christian education. It hurt us many times as far as financial. We went without a lot of things for a long time. But you know, God made a way. God made a way. Somehow, some way, God will make a way for your children. Amen. You may have to do without a few more luxuries in life, but that can come later. Amen? Because if you raise those kids and they don't get a foundation of the Word of God in them and they get indoctrinated by a, and there's a spirit behind those systems. If you look at the powers of hell and darkness, see the true child of God with a new heart and a new spirit. Understand there's a world, there's a powers and principalities out there that are influencing, influencing the powers that be. Amen? And very rarely can a young teenager 
boy or girl, make it through that system without being scathed. Either in morality, either in principle, ideology. And friend, you'll reap for it later in your later years. Unless that child comes home from that school system and you sit him, you sit Johnny down, you sit Susie down, and you begin to teach them the word of God. And you begin to wash them with the water, washing of the water of the word. And you begin to unravel the things they're being taught. And as they are learning the true history and true education, you know what's going to happen? Johnny's going to go to school and probably be sent home a few times. Because he's not going to go along with when, when the teacher's trying to say, we, evolution, we, we came from monkeys. We came from the Big Bang. You see, and there's going to be conflict. You better be ready for the battle. Amen. Let's move deeper down this thing. Let's listen to this. 90% of them attend or attended public school. 45% of them say that Sunday school did not teach them to, de to defend their faith. The Bible says in the book of Jude that we are to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. Amen. Children need a scriptural foundation in them. But we struggle to teach our children solid Bible doctrine that will give them a foundation because we as parents have forsaken the Word of God ourselves as, as we should not have done. We don't even know, for the most part, in the evangelical church what right doctrine is. Ooh. I feel the axe bouncing back. To the <laughs> you think about it. It's hard to teach your kids when you and I aren't assured in the faith. Amen? And I'm not saying that with a condemnation. It's a fact. We need good theology. We need to know what it is we believe. We have had to have an encounter with Jesus Christ ourselves. We have to know what the Word of God says. Amen? And the problem is if we raise them with no absolutes, then we raise them to be fish out of water when they're under attack. That's why it says 45% of them said they didn't know how to defend their faith. Especially when they hit the work world or they hit the secular world out there. I mean, I'm here to say, a lot of them, they say when you send them to secular college in that first year, they throw their faith off. I've seen that happen with one of my children. My eldest daughter, many years ago, went to a secular college to learn international business. Within the first year, she was out of the faith. We did our best to raise those girls in the doctrine of Christ. But decisions can still be made. Amen? She's accountable for what she believes or don't believes. Don't get me wrong. We've done our part. We've done our best. And friend, the best laid plans can go wrong. But God has given me a promise. Amen? When they're old, they won't depart from it. Amen? God can water that again. God can draw that heart back. Amen? And so hear me that way. But listen, think about it. We got to teach our young ones not to be ashamed of Jesus Christ, his shed blood, and the gospel, and tell them why. I mean, growing up, I, I tell you what, when Liz and I married, raising a, a two- and a four-year-old, Nicholas, man, I'll tell you what, in the back seat of that car, Every time he'd get in these conversations, he'd ask a question, why? He then he'd ask a question, why? He'd ask another question, why? Ask another question, why? And hours would go by. He always, he's still today asking why. He's inquisitive, amen, even though he's 21 years old. But I'm here to say, the, Nick has a bright mind. Nick knows what he believes. And he knows why he believes what he believes. Because he asked the question, why? And God helped me, but God gave me, always helped me answer his question. I didn't brush him off, push him off, and say, shut up, go to sit in your corner. I'm tired of you asking me why. No, I didn't do that. I thought any honest question, no matter how old, deserves an honest answer if I can give it to him. Amen. And Liz and I, that's how we raised our boys. We tell them the flip side. We not only just instituted something, this is why we do this. This is why we don't do this. This is why the Word of God says what it says. And this is why God is trying to keep us from something that would bring harm down the road. Explain why. But folks, it's hard to explain why when 
we don't know. Because we're not where we should be in our faith level. Amen? We're going to move on from this survey in a minute here. But this is, this is good material. This is where people live. That's why our children's church is so important. Folks, listen. I gave thanks to our children's church workers today, and I do thank God for them. But for the most part, our children need to learn the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of the Word of God, the doctrine of the Bible, taught by teachers that know the Word of God and know Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And folks, that's a high calling. That's just not, oh, children's church work, oh, children's church, oh, well, you know, my God, you, you and I will answer to God. We got to help this younger generation get a foothold in the faith. Amen. That's the church. It's the church now, but it's going to be the church when you and I, in, because of age, pass on, should the Lord tarry, they can take over and keep the thing rolling in the truth and in the faith and receive the blessing of God Almighty because the ministry is preaching the truth of the gospel. Amen. We go a little deeper into this. Now we hit the real controversial things. 45% of them, I'm sorry, 45% say homosexual behavior is not a sin or they're not sure or they don't know if it's a sin. First of all, I want to share something. God loves every sinner. He proved it by hanging on the cross for all sinners from all since the human race began. Jesus loves the drunkard. He loves the drug addict. He loves the homosexual. And thank God for that because while I was yet in my sins, he loved me. It's the love of God that brought me to repentance that didn't need to be repented of. God loved me. But I didn't bring my sin into the church. I didn't try to twist the word of God to justify my alcohol and my profanity. I knew it was wrong. I knew it was evil. And I didn't bring it into the house of God trying to justify my habits because God loved me. He loved me that I got the scorn of his countenance in my sin, but I felt his love. And when I cried out to Jesus that night, not only did he save me, he delivered me. The swearing, the profanity went away. A new heart I received. I had no desire for alcohol from that moment forward. But there was other things in my heart that took a while for God to work out. Indoctrination in the public system will tell you that homosexuality is a right. It is your free choice. No man has a right to tell you what you can do behind closed doors. That's, but they're not staying behind closed doors. That's the problem. First of all, some things are obvious. Number one, it's against nature. Nature even teaches you, you know, when I was a little kid, you know what they used to do for you in kindergarten and preschool? You'd have this little grid. You'd have a round ball. You'd have a little square cube. You'd have a rectangle. You'd have a star. And you know what you had to do? Put the right shapes into the right place. Nature tells you the way God has designed woman and the way God has designed a man. Things work pretty good. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Amen. <clears throat> and I won't go the other place because I don't want to get into that, that kind of thing here. But I'm saying anybody with a rational mind will tell you there's something ain't right with that. Something isn't right. And we're not here to bash gay people. They're not gay, by the way. They're not happy. They're sodomites. That's what they are. No kind of, I'm not, I'm not putting, the, the Bible calls them sodomites. All right? But God can deliver every homosexual. The same power that delivered me from alcoholism can deliver the homosexual from that desire. 
and cleanse them from all unrighteousness. Amen? And give them a brand new help and a brand new heart and a brand new start in life. So there's no condemnation to them, but their sin condemns them. My sin condemned me. Amen? So we got to be careful as Christians that we, we just really get on that, but everything else is okay. Somehow, well, that's not as bad, and that's not as bad. No, don't get me wrong. There are good sins, bad sins. Well, no, there's no good sin. There's, I better rephrase that. <laughs> there's sins that on the measuring scale might rate a one or two. Other ones are going to be a full-blown ten. All sin is sin, and even anything past point zero 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 one will damn your soul. Disqualify one from entering heaven. Only the blood of Jesus can make us pure and spotless and acceptable in the sight of God. And how that blood is appropriated to your heart and life is that you, my friend, must come clean with Jesus Christ. Not through infant baptism, not through sacramental salvation, not through church membership, not by trying to be a good little old good old boy. It is by acknowledging your condition of original sin before Almighty God and receiving by faith his remedy, which is the shed blood of Jesus Christ for your sin, your personal condition a personal sin. And when you feel that conviction and you ask Jesus Christ to come into your heart and cleanse you, he'll save you, wash you clean, and make all things new. And you are saved as Jesus Christ, amen, because you've made room in your heart for him by faith. Hallelujah. We go a little farther. I'll, I'll wind this down here. 40% believe gay couples should be allowed to marry. Why does that surprise us if 45% say that that behavior is not wrong? So why not? See, the foundations. If the foundations be destroyed, what should the righteous do? You get the foundation wrong, you build a house on sand. You build your life on sand. Your marriage on sand. Your children on sand. Which Jesus said, the wind will blow. The waves will come. The rain, the, the rain will crash into that house one day. If it's founded on the rock, it'll make it through the storm. But if it's on sand, everything will crumble. Everything will crumble. And great is the fall of that house. Hmm. 20% say there are books other than the Bible. Well, now we're moving on from Scripture. Now everybody's book... We can say, well, God might be in that too. Another, another way to bring confusion. And then 65% said that if you're a good person, you will go to heaven. That's merit salvation based on your goodness. If Jesus Christ, if God saves on the basis of good behavior, good intentions, morality, then Jesus Christ would not have had to die on the tree. Jesus Christ would not have had to pay the sin debt of man. If man can behave himself in the heaven or into the favor of God, then why did Jesus Christ, God become man, the incarnation, and why did he have to go to the cross to pay for the sin debt of mankind? They said 65%. You asked 70, you asked 85% of the people on that street, how are you going, are you going to heaven? Oh, yeah, well, how do you know? Well, I'm, I, I try hard. I do good things. Well, I, I belong to this church. I belong to that church. Um, I do good things for people. I give. I, I help people out. I work hard. I, I do good things. I, you know, I don't kick my dog when I'm mad. You, you know, good things, you know, so we do good things. We do good things. And so God will see that, and God will be pleased with my life because you're a good little boy. And he'll take me to heaven when I die. Wrong. It's not how it works. It's not how it works. You must exhibit personal faith through repentance towards God. And that goes back to the first question. Are you born again? Are we born again? Have we given our heart and life to Jesus Christ from a sincere heart? 
If we have, we're saved. And as long as we maintain faith, we'll always be saved, no matter what, no man can pluck you out of his hand. Because you are in faith. Amen. Hallelujah. You know, preaching like this, this is where, this is where the rubber meets the road. This is where people will stop coming to a church like this. I'll preach to you the truth this morning. Everything I said, I can back up with not just one scripture, but probably 20 or 30 or 40, if not more. If you go home and read your Bible, you'll find, if you try to refute anything we taught today, you'll find that you can't use the Word of God to defend your point of view. So that tells me our point of view has to change if you want to advance with God. Amen. Do you want to move on with God? Do you really want Him? Do you really want Him in your life? Do you really want salvation? Do you really want what Jesus Christ offers? Do you really want that? And this is for live stream too, wherever this DVD will go. We all want God until He requires obedience to the faith. Well, that's just how you proclaim it, Pastor. Well, what's your view? We're under grace, Pastor. We are. I, believe, I preach the grace of God. Everything through the cross. You can't earn your salvation. You can't work for it. You can't. There's nothing you can do right now to earn your right into heaven. You can only receive what's been provided through Jesus Christ as a finished work. And you receive it by faith. So you're not saved by joining this church. You're not saved by liking me or hating me. You're not saved by merit or being a church member. You are saved because somewhere in your history, you felt convicted of your sin, and you realized you were undone, and you needed God and His Son. Have you been to that moment yet? Because until that comes, and until your heart starts yearning for God, there's going to be good evidence that you maybe didn't receive your new heart and your new spirit. And you know why a lot of churches have trouble, church splits and all this other? It's not just the devil. you got half the congregation that's unconverted, unredeemed, but are religious. And so when the preacher has to preach the word of God, then there's an uprising in half the congregation because they're unregenerate. They're not saved. Think they are, but they're not. The Lord knows them that are His. And let everyone that names the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Do you know what iniquity means? It is sin that we try to justify. Behavior we try to justify. Listen. I don't take a lot of time on Facebook. A few minutes, I'll try to go through and... All of a sudden, I'm, I'm finding we've got like 400 friends on there. I'm thinking, wow, friends? I don't even know 95% of them, but they send your requests. Oh, okay, okay. But a lot of these people, by what they post on Facebook, you can tell you're a child of God. You claim Christianity? And you, and you post things on there with F-bombs and four-letter words and lewdness. There's something not right there. Something not right there. Something not right. But God is not done with you and with me. He is not done with the human race and his church. Because my Bible still says there's going to be a revival in this last hour of time. And God is yet going to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. And your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams. Your young men will prophesy the word of God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says in Isaiah 61 that those that are of faith, the Bible says according to the prophet Isaiah, 
that these people will raise up former desolations. In other words, it's a church that has come back to the foundations of the faith. It is individuals who got sick and tired of playing churchianity and meant business with Jesus Christ. And we got things right with God. We asked them to cleanse our heart. We got back into the faith. Amen. And we began to walk in the truth and nothing but the truth. And our lives again begin to have salt, have a little influence. It would begin to hold back a little bit of corruption. Amen. And push that spirit of the world out of the house of God. But it has to get out of this house first. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. The true grace of God teaches me to deny all ungodliness and worldliness and ungodly longings. And I know when I'm in the grace of God that I know. Hallelujah. He's teaching me and enabling me to want to live right by the help of his spirit. Amen. And friend, it's still an imputed righteousness given to us by faith. Amen. They that be of them shall raise up the former desolations. I'll pray to God if that survey was taken in our church that we won't have the percentages that we see right there. That tells me we got work to do, friend. This pastor has work to do. This pastor's wife has work to do. This congregation has work to do. We start by getting on our knees and getting things right with Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 You know, we, we, they, you know, they're pulling down the Ten Commandments. They're trying to pull God out of the schools wherever you can, out of the government and everything. And we go, oh, oh, they're trying to get prayer out of this or prayer out of that, you know. But I'll tell you what, why don't we get prayer back into our house? Why don't we get prayer back into this house? Why don't we get prayer back into our homes? Amen. Back into our marriages. Amen. Amen. Let husbands do and, and be enabled to do what God says do. And women, the same thing. Be the wife God says and will help you to be. Amen. And then our children will be unity in the home and parents won't be divided against the other. That the kids can understand that this is a, not a divided house. A amen. We say, but they don't work with me. My spouse don't work with me. Doesn't matter. You make the difference then. You stand in the truth that makes you free. You get your theology squared away and get your house in order by the help and grace of God. And God will use your life to raise up the former desolations. If we'll but repent, humble ourselves and pray. If we'll confess our sin, 2 Chronicles 7, 14. God will hear from heaven. He'll humble my life first. Help me, Lord. Because I can't be what I need to be without him. Without a relationship with Jesus Christ, where it ought to be. And if it's where it needs to be, God can go to work. He can redeem the time. He can raise up former desolations where there's been error, where there's been mistakes, where there's been sin, where there's been disunity. From this day forward, God can make a change and heal your land. And heal your land. Hallelujah. Oh, glory. Musicians, please. God's going to do a work in us. God's doing a work in my life. God is doing a work in this world and in this land. Time is running out. Jesus Christ is about to burst that eastern sky. The Word of God tells us clearly we are to occupy until He comes. That means that I must be about my father's business as Jesus was until he returns. And should I go through the grave before I meet him, then I will die in faith. And I will do, I know this, that if I go to the grave, and if he doesn't come for another how many years, I've done my part. And I believe he'll look at me one day and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter you into the joy of the Lord. Amen. Are we born again? Do we believe the Bible is the inerrant word of God? 
Do we have a walk with Jesus Christ? Are we regenerated? Do we have a new heart, a new heart, a new spirit? Are we trusting in what Christ has done for me? Are we lapsing, relapsing in the old traditions of men and churches? And are we trusting in sacraments and church membership and good behavior and other things to get the favor of God? My friend, if God sees your life and doesn't see Christ and your faith in his cross, you're going to come up short and you're going to be found wanting. And I'll guarantee it, men will see your life that something is amiss. Something isn't right there. But we can change that today. Going forward, God can make all grace abound. He can heal our land. He can restore our soul. He can renew our faith. He can strengthen us with might in our inner man. All God says, come to me, all you that are heavy laden. I will give you rest. God loves you. He's not here to condemn any heart, any life, anybody by live stream, wherever this message goes. God isn't here to condemn. God's here to heal. God's here to deliver and to set us free. Amen. Let's stand this morning. I'm going to ask eldership to come up. I know we already had a prayer time this morning, but we're, we're going to, I believe, this is what I'm going to ask. I feel the Holy Spirit. Maybe this message isn't for our hearts directly. I think it could be. But you've got children and grandchildren. You've got loved ones that are away from the Lord that should know better. I'm going to ask you to come up with the eldership. I'm going to ask eldership, those that normally help us pray, come on up. And I'm going to ask you to stand in proxy for those children, for those grandchildren, for those coming generations, that there would be a desire for the things of God, a desire for the truth of the Word of God, that God help us save your spouse, save my child, save my grandchild, save my daughter, my son my nephew, my mom, my dad. Let's come. And let's believe. Let's come. Let's come right now. You have a prayer need, let's come. Let's come. Every new arise spirit within Let's stand in for our children, for that which belongs to us. Let's stand in right now. Let's believe God. Anybody else? Anybody else? Come, let's come. Oh, cast me not away from thy presence, O oh Lord. And take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Anybody else today? Anybody else need to come up? else this morning you need a touch from God you want to stand in for somebody that God has put in your heart Oh! 